everyone. Welcome to Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. Uh, This is an episode about Grove City College. It's somewhat listener generated. I had a request to uh, review a particular podcast that uh, was recorded at Grove City College, which I'd like to go through at least a few of the clips. It's about an hour and I think 17 minutes or so, so we can't go through the whole thing. But I'll, I'll bring you to some choice sections so you can get the gist of what was being communicated there. And really, this relates to a controversy that's been ongoing since I believe it was early last fall when, uh, or maybe it was late summer, I think it was early fall when, um, when, when I found out about it. But the issue was, and is still, whether or not Grove City College and the administration there approved of critical race theory being taught in the chapels, being taught in some course content, and then also uh, being taught to the RAs, I believe, on campus. And so... Uh, three major different areas. Now, this has taken on a life of its own, interestingly enough. And the the way that this has gone down, uh, broadly speaking, is the administration at Grove City College and many of the professors, including Carl Truman, who's a very prominent professor there, have put up the defense shields and tried to either minimize uh, to, to, to the point that essentially they're, they're bending truth, they're lying, uh, what's happened there. Or uh, and um, claiming that there really isn't a problem and that it's these haters, it's these horrible people, mostly on the internet, who have made a problem where there was no problem. And uh, it, it's very similar to the way Southern Baptist schools have reacted when they've been called out on the carpet. Now, the difference, I think, is that in Southern Baptist circles, there is such a strong guild mentality, allegiance to the Southern Baptist Convention, reliance on the Southern Baptist Convention, not wanting to rock the boat in the Southern Baptist Convention because that could prohibit someone in the future from getting paid positions and uh, and all, all the the accolades that come with that, that the, the wagons are circled not just in the school, but also in the denomination and among all the other entities. And so just about. So there's a concerted effort right away to... Uh, identify and disparage or um, try to marginalize somehow anyone who would speak out against uh, or or even just shine a light and say this is happening at one of their institutions of higher learning. And and so it, it's kind of like antibodies viewing the, the person who says this as the virus. The whistleblower is the virus. They're the threat and let's all gang up. And then others see that example and then they're really hesitant to say anything. And that's kind of, it, it's, it's very... It's intimidation driven. And uh, it within the SBC, the SBC is basically a big bubble. It's n- not people outside the SBC aren't necessarily as astute on SBC politics or even interested in that kind of thing. And so trying to reform from the inside is almost impossible. That's the conclusion that I've come to. It's it's just about impossible uh, to to do that from within the denomination. And, and there's probably a variety of other factors I could talk about that also lead me to think that. But with Grove City, it's a little different. It's a smaller school. And there is a connection to political conservatism, at least there has been historically. In fact, I consider going to Grove City College for undergrad. It was one of those schools that prided itself on not taking uh, federal funds. I believe there's only two. I think it was Grove City College. And then um, also, uh, what's the college in Michigan? Uh, Hillsdale. I believe those are the two that don't do that. And, and so they, they had a reputation for being not just Christian, but also politically conservative, but they're supposed to be both. And so I think because that's a larger group of people and they don't have the same necessarily allegiance to Grove City College, the brand, unless maybe you went there or you, you're, on the, you're a donor or something like that, you, you might have some allegiance. But the, broadly speaking, political conservatives aren't like, they don't rely on Grove City College for any kind of... Uh, privileges that they would need, and if they said anything, they would get canceled. There, there's, there's room for saying negative things, at least if you're outside the institution, uh, which many of the people who have said something are, and, and so uh, I think that is a different dynamic. I think the other thing uh, is that Grove City College itself doesn't have all the resources that the Southern Baptist Convention has to try to fight something like that, and so. Um, the, the logical thing, I've said this from the beginning, the logical thing is just to, to be honest about where you were wrong. People mess up, people make mistakes, and admit those things. But instead, because they've been so defensive, and they've, they've 
in, in various ways attacked, at least members of the administration attacked people who have just pointed out the truth of the situation. It has wound up in now where it's it's totally it's just it's messy. It's just totally messy. And it, it's created all kinds of doubt and mistrust and instability that didn't ever need to be there. And this is, in my opinion, this is just on Grove City College. This is, they, they could have avoided a lot of this, but they, uh, for whatever reason, and perhaps pride is the motivation here to, you know, we wouldn't make mistakes, we're professionals. I, I don't know fully what all the motives are. That's the one that, the only one that seems to make sense of their behavior in my mind, because it's so, it just comes across as so arrogant. But that's, that, that's where we are now, where the, the people who see clearly and say, well, I, I saw the clips, I've seen the the uh, poster, I've seen evidence here that suggests, or at least proves, actually, that Grove City College has had some compromise in this area. Now they don't trust the administration. And and so th this is, it's, it's a messy situation. So why talk about it? Well, number one, I've talked about it before. So it's just a continuation of a, a previous discussion. Number two, uh, I think this is a place where change can happen more easily than an SBC school or maybe some of the other schools that have been challenged on this. I think there, there, there is a potential for leveraging um, the, the outside um, previous uh, or what was and still is to some extent the support that Grove City College had, the donors, uh, the reputation they had. I think there is a way perhaps with Grove City College to actually reform the college. And it's, it's, Let's be honest, it's a test case. American Reformer, Megan Basham, The Daily Wire, you know, both of these institute these entities came out and said something. And that's pressure that an SBC school hasn't really gotten from outside. They haven't had The Daily Wire going after Southeastern or something like that. So it it's it's more it's a different kind of pressure. It's more pressure. And and there's um there's an investigation as well. So I, I just I think that they're taking this as bad as the response has been. They're taking this a little more seriously. And I think people are watching, myself included, to see what actually happens. Is is reform possible at, at what was supposed to be one of the most conservative schools in the country, colleges? Is reform even possible there? And if it is, that's an encouraging thing, I think, that, okay, maybe we can learn from this and, and others uh, can, can go and try to reform their schools, maybe in a similar way. Maybe it looks different. I don't know. But it's it. We haven't seen a lot of uh, we haven't seen a lot of reform because the real virus is not the people who are saying there's a problem. In fact, those people, from everything I understand, most of those people, if not all, they love the school. I, I've been talking to people from within the school uh, at times who love the school and and they just they care about it. They don't want to see it go down this path. And and the virus isn't those people. The virus is the teaching that they've allowed to take root there and some of the people that they've invited to come to chapel and speak, and some of the people they're employing even there currently who uh, are advocating these kinds of things. Uh, if that's a, if there's a threat, that's the threat. And so um, that's, that, anyway, that's, that, that they may not be a threat to the institution in the minds of the administrators, but they actually are. They, they and, and more importantly, the institution doesn't really matter as much as the truth and the kingdom of God, and it, they should... I would think uh, at a Christian school, they should have more allegiance to Christianity uh, than they do to the institution, whatever that is. That That's going to burn, right? That's not something that we take into eternity. Uh, of course, the, the impact of an institution certainly has eternal effects, but if the institution is not the, the one that we should have allegiance to primarily. It's the Lord Jesus Christ and then his truth. And uh, we don't compromise on that. That that's that's where I'm coming down on this. So I just want to give you an update, and and hopefully this helps uh, to maybe encourage some of you, but also to expose some things that need exposing. And the speech uh, that I'm going to take clips from, or the the podcast episode, it, it doesn't have to be Grove City. This it's representative of what is going on at a lot of Christian institutions and schools. And so I think it might be helpful from that standpoint, even if you don't care about what's happening at Grove City. Well, maybe this is happening in a school near you. And, and so reviewing it might, might help that example. And, and, you know, how would you respond, right? That's a question that often gets asked. So I'll show you in some ways, maybe how I would respond or how I would think through some of the words you're about to hear. So first let's go uh, through a trip down memory lane. This is a, a, an account on Twitter called old McConnell. There's actually another account. Uh, and that account is called um, CRT at GCC. Both of these are on Twitter. 
And I don't know if they have links on other social media websites because I really don't like using Twitter. But uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the um, I'm pretty sure that this is the 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 best place that at least that I know of to, to find updates on these things. I know Josh Abatoy at the American Reformer will often talk about this issue as well. But here's what old McConnell, this Twitter account, stated about this issue. A lot has happened over the past five months, re the Grove City College controversy, but one document tells the story in a nutshell. GCC President McNulty's response to the critical race theory petition. This thread revisits that statement in light of what we know now. And I think this is 100% right. I did a whole podcast on President McNulty's uh, peti- response to the petition that parents had, and it was horrible. It was just horrible. It, w- it was insulting. It was it just wasn't true. It, it was terrible. And in light of what's come out, because what's come out now is, well, we you know, hey, nothing to see here. And then people are finding, oh, there's all this this stuff over here to see, and there's this over here to see, and there's and all kinds of things are coming out. I haven't covered all of them, but uh, I'll cover one of them today. And so this has promoted more mistrust. This is this has really shown that. President McDulty's defense was was really poor, poor, poorly chosen words, and, and, and a bad strategy. So here's the trip down memory lane. Reminder, concerned parents frustrated by campus programs that didn't match the college's state admission and advertised image launched a public petition that received 478 signatures in a week. McNulty's response, the president there, hasn't aged well. His combative tone further antagonized the petitioners, which guaranteed a prolonged dispute. And his pronouncements against Grove City College were gradually disproven by additional evidence. McNulty began by stating why he has decided to issue a formal response before receiving the petition. He says the petition included misinformed assertions and that that unfairly threaten the reputation of Grove City College. This statement implies, number one, the parents don't know what they're talking about. Number two, their actions are hurting the college's reputation. This unnecessarily placed McNulty in opposition to the parents and suggested bad faith on their part. I'm going to stop here. This is what's going on, not just at Grove City or at Christian institutions. This is what ha- is happening all over the, this country. In fact, even tonight, and the local school board in, in uh, town over from me is having a whole discussion about a, a book that uh, was in the school's library that fortunately this particular high school decided to get rid of. But now there's pushback and now and other districts have decided to keep this book. And um, and this kind of thing is happening all over. And often the school administration is saying nothing to see here. And the parents and they're placing themselves against the parents. And that's a, that's a losing position. It's a losing it's just bad. Uh, but but President McNulty has done the same thing that these secular administrators have done and principals at high schools and colleges that are uh, mostly high schools, really, that are secular. Uh, so it's, it's interesting to me to see this dynamic. Uh, going on here, next, McNulty lists Gr- Grove City College's vision, mission, and values to demonstrate the college isn't capitulating to cultural headwinds. He doesn't mention that two significant phrases, Christian worldview and conservative values, were just removed from the statements. See, I didn't even know about this. This is new to me. So, like I said, there's there's little things popping up all over the place. Like, hey, why why did you move, remove those those terms from the mission statement? McNulty also states that humans are made in the image of God and should not be defined by ideological categories. Additional evidence shows the campus program officers named in th- this statement did in fact define students by ideological categories. He says next, the section, this next section strongly implies that the parents' petition is an attack based on misimpressions, partial reports, hearsay rumors, and other unreliable information. Uh, so it's accusing the parents um, that they're bearing false witness. McNulty then avoids real issues by answering questions not asked. Petition cons- cons- the petition was concerned with critical presentation, with an uncritical, I should say, presentation of CRT. And wokeness, McNulty defends Christian engagement in social issues. He quotes Carl Truman, who later uses the same tactic by arguing Grove City College isn't fully woke. And I read some of those to you. They were terrible. Absolutely terrible. It just, for someone who is apparently as smart as Carl Truman, it, it's either, you can only have really two two options. Number, either you're you're being disingenuous with the truth or you're ignorant. And ignorance is just, it's a hard pill to swallow. It's like, this is the institution you work for, like. How can you know so little about and be so sure of so many erroneous things about the institution you're at when you're so good on things outside that institution? That's a bad thing. 
Uh, it goes on. It says the previous section essentially implied that parents are liars who didn't handle their concerns in a Christian way. At this point in the statement, one expects McNulty to present un unassailable evidence to back such a strong rebuke to the parents' character and claims. Instead, what follows is a selective defense that addresses narrow points to give the impression that no CRT problem exists, but leaves out important context indicating otherwise. For example, McNulty says CRT was never mentioned nor advocated in chapel. Now here's, uh, actually it's quoting to, it's uh, linking to a montage of different chapel speakers uh, that I uh, put together. And um, and it says Tisby, the, the Jamar Tisby's talk was about, uh, was, a two, uh, was part of a larger two-week program on social justice. And one of the chaplains uh, called for students to join the resistance. Uh, it's horrible, by the way. If you watch this whole thing, you'll just see, wow, okay, yeah, like critical race theory was in the chapel. McNulty next says there is a significant amount of misunderstanding about the Office of Multicultural Education Initiatives. Later, he admits that the, that in, the involvement in RA trainings, uh, that, that they were involved in RA trainings. And the event focused on white privilege also uh, discovered, and they have some screenshots here. Uh, in fact, look, look, check this out. There's a poster. Let's talk about race series. White people, a documentary. Come and join and watch with us from the Office of Multicultural Education and Initiatives, uh, which if you go, you can watch that on YouTube. It's, it's not a good uh, documentary. Uh, McNulty says diversity council only focused on recruiting minority students and isn't operational yet. The college's own press release says that it was established to broaden perspectives and enrich campus culture. This is the same thing, by the way, happened at Southeastern with kingdom diversity initiative. Uh, and, and that's, it was the defense too. It's like, well, we're just helping out disenfranchised students. That's all it is. In fact, Danny Aiken says in this book on racism that, uh, he compares himself to his mom. His mom would give a student a ride who was, um, black. And this was years, this is when he was a kid. And someone asked, why'd you give that student a ride? I said, well, because he needed a ride. And Danny Aiken says, well, that's why we put up kingdom diversity. Because some people, they, they need a ride, basically, which of course is totally different. It's not on the basis of needing a ride that you're, because you, if it was that, it would be economics driven or, you know, it's it's instead on the basis of your, your race, but then also whether or not you're going to be an activist. Because I've seen the questions that are asked. You have to promote diversity on campus, or at least prove that you, you have a history of promoting diversity. So it's not enough to be black you, or, or Hispanic or Asian. You have to uh, show that you've, you've promoted diversity in your life. And that's what they're looking for. But it's beyond that. They, they produce podcasts and host events, and they have money for all kinds of things. And uh, that's and it's the same thing at Grove City College. Their, their office that does has a similar function. It's not just about giving scholarships away. It's, it's about uh, promoting an agenda. Absolutely. So um, next, McNulty sidesteps CRT activism uh, course, Education 290, stating academic leadership will address the issue on a case-by-case -case basis. Books by Kendi and D'Angelo remain in the spring 2022 uh, installment with co-instructor and uh, Cedric Lewis, Cedric Lewis uh, claims he hasn't changed a thing. So they are teaching at Grove City College right now in one of the courses, White Fragility, and how to be an anti-racist. These are both critical race theory books. McNulty uh, concludes by highlighting Western civilization requirement in Grove City College's core curriculum. In actuality, the crime was recently reduced and the entire core is under review by a committee, including many people involved in the CRT controversy. The parents' petition actually understated the CRT problem at Grove City College. Uh, question, was McNulty unaware of these incidents or did he uh, knowingly display downplay the issues and chastise parents by for publicly identifying them uh, mcnulty concludes with more conciliatory tone uh, the parents are collaborators who share an unwavering commitment to the college's mission that is difficult to square with his earlier combativeness one wonders how the statement might have read if this was his approach throughout if mcnulty had engaged concerned parents as partners who wanted what's best for the kids and grove city college the CRT issues might have been resolved quick and positively. Here's hoping that the Groove City College board can right the ship. A formal apology to parents would be a good start. And that's, I think, the big thing. That's the big thing. You can't just say, you, you have to admit that there's something went wrong. That, that even if it's slight in your mind, you have to admit it as an administrator. Say, we goofed or we weren't aware or something has to, you, you have to, apologize to now because now the parents have they've been sinned against they've been mischaracterized they've been they've been lied about in this uh, characterization by paul mcnulty 
they need to be apologized to. Uh, they had legitimate concerns. Those concerns are rooted in objective fact. And those who should know the most about this situation, the president and those at the school, are the one, the very ones uh, who seem to be either the most ignorant of it or the ones willing to cover it up. So it, it, cor corruption and CRT, in my mind, they just go hand in hand. I, I've seen this over and over and over. So uh, what do we do about all this? What do we... Uh, and the, the real... I believe there's actually, in my um, from the last I checked, there was a, an investigation that's currently, I think it's still ongoing. I think the board is investigating just to see, hey, were there problems? Is, the, is there anything to this petition the parents put out? So pray for that. Uh, we'll see what happens. I wanted to, to introduce to you something else, though, and this is what I was uh, asked to review. Uh, this is a podcast put out um, by, let's see here. This is, I guess it must be a club on campus. Um, let me see if I can, I should have had this queued up here. I thought uh, for some reason that all, all the, the the info was there. I think it's on the CRT at GCC. I think they have a whole thing on it. Yeah, it's right here. Uh, okay, so th this is a podcast at Grove City College called One Story by uh, Ariana Nelson. Now, and, and I don't know whether or not this had the sanction of the school. I'm assuming it must have uh, because they, they are holding events. So it's either a club that sponsored it or maybe the campus itself. It's probably a club. But they, they I mean, she remarks at the beginning they had a big crowd there and they're at Grove City College and they're talking about Grove City College, broadly speaking. So uh, this, this took place at the college. Uh, and what's, what's important to all this is uh, Chris Merrick happens to be the assistant director of residence life, the resident and the resident director of Kettler Hall in resident life. So this is someone who is employed by Grove City College, working there uh, with uh, the I guess it would be the RAs. And I believe yeah, Christopher Merrick was one of the ones in that montage uh, speaking in chapel who really put some pro CRT type stuff out there. Now here's a longer podcast and. I want to play for you uh, some clips from this podcast, and and we'll review them as we go because these are indicative, representative of what we're hearing um, around us, and what we have heard around us. And I think it also shows, though, that yes, this problem at Grove City College went beyond just a few chapel sessions, uh, and and you, it's. It, very aware. You're very aware after listening to something like this in, in its fullness that, wow, okay, there's a problem there. All right, so I'm just going to play some short clips from this particular podcast and just give you a sense uh, of what's going on. So I'm going to start here about eight minutes in, uh, eight and a half minutes in uh, for this interview with Chris Merrick. So you said that, that the cons weigh heavier than the pros? Oh. Or, 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 so, yeah. So go... With that in mind, why do you think it's so important that people know what, like, or at least hear what it feels like to be a minority? Because I, I think no one inherently likes to be mistreated, right? Like, raise your hand if you like being treated like trash. Like, no one, <laughs> no, no one enjoys that, right? Like, no one, no one enjoys to be disrespected. No one enjoys to be marginalized. And so, I think for me, like. Um, I'm not a student here, right? And so, like, I, I don't think people are brazen enough to, to say some of the things that they say to their peers. Um, All right, so he goes on, he talks about how bad it is to be a black person, uh, the negative things associated with that. And so this is strong language. He says, basically, you're treated like trash. That's, that's his direct quote. You're treated like trash. And uh, it's, he, he's talking about Grove City College, though, included here. Because the very next thing is, well, People aren't brazen enough to say the things to me that they would say to their friends. So, you know, I don't hear all the the slurs and the things that I would normally uh, that people want to say to me because I, I'm not a student. I'm in a position of authority, basically. But that's that's what it is to be a black person, including at Grove City College. That's what he's saying here. I don't go to Grove City College. Maybe some Grove City College parents and students can pipe in here. And then, and then you can tell me who's attacking Grove City College or who's, if this isn't true, I mean, if you're a minority, are you treated like trash at Grove City College? Is that accurate? If you're not, if that doesn't uh, actually represent what happens at Grove City College, then you, you have a guy who's being paid by the college on staff there who 
is fine characterizing the college this way. And, and yet the, the administration doesn't see him as a threat. That, isn't that interesting? I just find that interesting. So uh, he, he talks on about that for a while. I want to go to, um, to a section a little later here where they talk about white privilege. I thought he was cool, and he was gonna find out that day, like, bro, like, you end up on the floor. Like, so be careful, you know? Uh, and I, honestly, I mean, the only reason why I didn't touch that boy because I knew I had more than what he did. So he's, he's getting done sharing a story here of when he was in college and how there was someone who used, I think it was an abbreviation or, or an acronym that included the N word and uh, applied it to him. And it was someone who, uh, he was supposedly this person thought that he was friends with Chris and and Merrick and uh, it was this horrible horrible thing and they and she talks about the way that the, the school reacted to it and really the, the people there there wasn't anyone who approved of it that I mean his pastor was against it the school uh, did did something about it. It, it his friends were all defensive of him and uh, it, no one approved of this it's, it's a guy who said something uh, she shouldn't have said and. And, and so this is what he has to say, though, after telling the story. So, so um, what you just described is evidence that white privilege still exists. The fact that someone in a position of privilege thought that it was appropriate to employ an extremely derogatory word in any situation is evidence that white privilege still exists and is very much a threat to equality. And yet some people are uncomfortable or even disagree with the idea that, that, it, that white privilege exists. So why do you think so many people still cannot and do not acknowledge that it's a very prominent and dangerous threat to equality? And, and what would you say to those people? Let me stop here. This is a question he's asked. Does this, think about this. This is the person who just said that you're treated like trash. Even in Grove City College, if you're a minority, that's what it's like to be a minority. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means the other people, it means white people, are the ones that are treating someone like trash. That's who they are, right? So you can characterize, uh, you can, you can characterize them like this, or the, that this is the the status quo, this is regular life, normal life for someone who's a minority there, and yet um, then a story in which it's according to Chris Merritt, this what this. Uh, young student did was who, who apparently he says was annoyed was trying to study Chris and his friends were being obnoxious this kid said something he shouldn't have said and then no one's supporting that kid they're all against what he did the administration's against what he did his pastor's against what he did his friends are against what he did that's somehow evidence that there's white privilege because someone can say something even though they're condemned for it because they can say it. But you can go and you'd say that, well, you're treated like trash if you're a minority, and that's not evidence of anything. That's, you, what, what it, it's just, if you flipped all of this, it would sound funny to our ears, I think. If you were a white person, that's like, well, yeah, you know, uh, if you, you know, how, who wants to be treated like trash? And if you are in the inner city and you're white, you're treated like trash. Uh, and and that's, that's how those people treat you. Um, that you'd probably be accused of racism. Uh, and if you and if someone said something against white people like that <laughs> or called them white trash, right, uh, what would happen uh, to them? Would it would it be the same kind of reaction? Right. So th this is how one of one of the indicators, how, how you know that there there's a double standard being employed, which critical race theory totally is based on a double standard. It's it's. Uh, it, it's obviously influenced from Marxism and postmodernism, but the, it, it, the whole idea is that you drill down even uh, deep into our language and our conception of knowledge and as, as deep as you can go, and there's power dynamics at work, and it's white people oppressing black people or minorities. And, um, and so we have to adjust everything to help those minorities reach a status of equality somehow by redistributing um, money or it might just be redistributing privilege and platforming and, and all that. So it's it's a double standard at the end. You have to view people according to their race uh, for this to work. And then that's how the, the justice comes in. And so th this one of the ways you, you recognize it is by seeing a double standard come out, which we're already kind of starting to see here. Now, I'm gonna, I wanna hear his answer here. Let's listen to this. This is Chris Merrick, uh, who works at Grove City College, explaining the, 
uh, what, what white privilege is and the evidence for it. Um, I'm not white, so it's, it's hard for me to tell someone how they should feel. Um, but again, with my little interaction, right, like I'm very, and, and I think, right, like we all to some degree, I'm very, like, I'm, I'm not that old, right, like I'm not even 30 yet, right, and so like, we have, I have a very limited worldview, um, but I, I think in my mind, why, and, and again, right, you can correct me if you're wrong, because you're white, you're white, woman, right, um, but I think when I've in, interacted with white people who have such a, a hard time with white privilege, one or two things happen. They feel this personal attack on them as if they created this, this privilege, which I don't think current white people have created. They, they definitely create the system, but they benefit from the system. And I think when you tell them, when they hear that, they, they hear that you're saying that they're wrong. Um, and especially white people who, who want to help and want to engage. That, that's kind of a, 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 a punch to the gut. Um, and there's this weird tension of, of, of you, them not wanting to own up to their, their privilege, right? And so like, and we all have privilege to some degree, right? Like as a man, I have privilege and I know that, right? Um, and th there are certain things that I get because I'm a man, right? I, I know when I walk in the room, all eyes, like, you don't look, you don't pay attention, right? Um, and so, and, and I think the, the reason why white privilege is so difficult because it says, hey, you gotta look at yourself and you gotta say, hey, I'm a part of a systemic issue in our country. And and again, right, I think when people hear, like when they hear that, that, that phrase, that term, they, some people just don't wanna face that music, right? Like, I think when, like, when you become a believer, right, like, in order to, to acknowledge that you know Jesus, you have to admit that you're wrong. And we inherently do not want to do that as people. Like, we don't want to admit that we have problems, right? And so, like, when you have something so charged as white privilege, especially in today's world, you're like, yo, like, you're, just because you're a white individual, you benefit from these systems. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you don't work hard, right? Like, I, like my friends, like, my, their grandparents, like, they work really hard, right? It doesn't mean that you're lazy. I think that's what people hear. And I'm like, I'm not calling you lazy. I'm just saying, right or wrong, you benefit from, from a system that was built by people who look like me, right? Like, you think of slavery, right? Like, that was free labor for 200 and some years, and you think you're not benefiting from a system? Like, two plus two is four, right? Not, not, we don't have to do all this one point. Like, no, dog, two plus two gives you four. And, and, and white people have benefited from a system in America that pushes them above people. And, and, and I think. We okay, so I don't want to uh, play. There, there's a part he gets to where he basically states, he comes out and he says that it's not personal. It's not like I'm, I, he says, I'm, I'm not to, to a white person. I'm not trying to condemn you. You're just part of this bigger group, right? And that's this whole argument he's making here. That's what it is. This white privilege uh, conception is that you're just part of this group, and even even said from what you just heard, you know, you, you might be trying to help, and that's a hard thing to hear because you don't agree with that and you want to help that, but you're part of the problem essentially. You're having all this benefit, this, this uh, privilege allocated to you, and and that gives you a benefit that others don't have. So, um, it, for lack of a better term, he kind of puts everyone in a box, right? And uh, regardless of circumstance, uh, if you're white, you have this, right? So I, th I think that's interesting to me. So he's viewing, th throughout this podcast, you see he views white people as a, as a block. He says, yes, they're individual white people, but you got to understand that you have this thing attached to you, right? You're, you're as, a, uh, as a block. Now, um, I want you to remember that because it's going to be important later on for something else I'm going to play uh, from Chris Merrick. Uh, I want to skip ahead here to, we're going to skip actually, uh, let's see, how far do we want to skip ahead? Let's go to 33 here. We're going to come back to the white privilege stuff too, but let, let's skip ahead quite a bit um, and just hear a little bit about Black Lives Matter, whether or not Chris Merrick is, is in favor of that. 
first projects together. But and they were able to have like real hard conversations because these people came from different walks of life and they appreciated each other. You know, uh, and that wasn't my college experience, right? Like it was, it, it it was oftentimes me saying like, "Hey, have you thought about the minority in this room?" Right? Like, have you thought about those things? And, and those guys at that point were like, "Yo, like we gotta think, we gotta think through these things, right?" And it was the, it was the black kid telling his black friends like, "Yo, like we ain't gonna be playing all hip hop music, right? Like we gonna throw some country in there because you know Mason loves." Them. Garth Brooks. <laughs> Why you playing at that party? I don't know, but I'm gonna let you be great, y'all. Um, but like, even, even those little small things where you see people like thinking about somebody else other than themselves, and me not necessarily having to teach them, yeah. yo, like you should care about other people, yeah. right? Like, why should I tell you that that other people matter, yeah. right? And so, like, and I think for me, like having that experience, and not saying that you don't have like. I don't want y'all hear me like going all the way in that Grove City, right? Because I don't think I would not be here if I did not believe in a mission at Grove City or I didn't value the work that you students put in or, or the staff and faculty put in. But like it is it there there has been this difference versus me being there yeah. and here where like like if I would say Black Lives Matter there, like they wouldn't trip. You 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 say it here and they call you a socialist. And I'm like, that makes me a socialist because I'm telling you that, like, or I'm just liberal. That's, you know, that it's a, it's a liberal, right? So when I say health, like, if I, if I say health care for all, oh, you're freaking sisters. Yeah, I'm like, okay, my bad, dog. And, you know, and, and they don't mean it as a compliment, right? It's a, it's a freaking, it's a dig, you yeah. know what I'm saying? But, like, Lord knows, I say, somebody says something about you and your guns, you're going to flip out, right? And it's like, I don't care about your guns, dog. Keep your, keep your, Yo, yo, 12 gates locked on you, dog. I don't care. You want to kill deer? Go ahead and be my guest. You know what I'm saying? Um, I ain't gonna argue with you, doc. Um, but, but, like, being there and seeing those students, and I think because they have a true relationship with each other yeah. and they value different people, that's what helped them engage with each other, right? So it's like, if you are my homie and you my friend and you say you value me and you care for me, how I live life to you matters. And, and there's one thing if I'm doing something that's inherently morally wrong, I expect you to say something and not jump for joy for that. Mm -hmm. But seeing those guys like celebrate each other, you know, the weird kid, kid like, you know what I'm saying, and say like, oh, thanks, you're a part of the crew. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, the, the kid that that wanted to blare country music. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, um, but you know it happens. You know, um, you know I I, don't, I really don't like country music, but I was. I'm going to stop there. So uh, you're going to see this, you're going to see a bunch of contradictions come out. You already saw one I pointed out with uh, at the beginning with, um, well, there's, there's evidence of white privilege because someone said something, but then you see Chris Merrick says things, but that's not evidence of, of privilege on his part or anything like that. He doesn't have that because the narrative is what's important, not, not the conditions on the ground. One, you're noticing something else coming out here too. Um, you'll see Chris Merrick say, he'll, he'll say you're treated like trash if you're a minority and he applies that to Grove City College. You're gonna hear him again at a clip at the end where he talks about how uh, he can't go to church because basically he's too white. He's just, he's so exhausted from the whiteness at Grove City College. So he has to travel to go to church so he can go uh, be with black people essentially. And and, so I'll, and I'll play that for you. But then he'll also say things about how great it is at Grove City that everyone just treats you like an individual. Well, which is it, right? Which is it? That That's one of the problems. Like you can't really have it both ways. Like which which way is it? Because in, in so doing, even saying how the people at Grove City College are, well, they treat you, uh, they even accept the weird people and apparently the people who like country music and want to uh, play that, uh, if, and that in Chris's mind. I mean, you're, you're Grove City in Pennsylvania. I would think there'd be a lot of people who like country music there probably. But uh, anyway, Chris Chris thinks, you yeah, know, that's strange. But in, in, in talking about it this way, listen to how he kind of makes fun. He kind of, he's saying that it's a dig when you're called a socialist because you like BLM or universal healthcare. You're, it's a dig when you like those things. Yet at the same time, what is he doing? He's digging people who make those associations. And he's basically saying they're hypocrites because look, they're going to defend their gun rights. So if they defend their gun rights, but they don't care about BLM, like there's, there's some hypocrisy going on there. 
And, and he, he kind of mocks them and you hear the students laughing at, you know, because they know the people that like their guns and stuff. But the, the, the reality is, you know, maybe, maybe those people who want to defend themselves and their right to bear arms and know that it's under threat and know that uh, that could be a challenge, the people who actually want their guns, right, and want to be able to fulfill the responsibility to protect and then also those same people are, are being consistent. They're trying to, they're looking at BLM and they're saying, hey, it's actually, there, there is Marxism here. There is socialism. He's mocking that idea, but that's the very founders of BLM said they're trained Marxists. So um, I, don't, I don't see what the, the, the issue is here. I mean, they refer to each other as comrade and they're uh, on, the, on the website or at least uh, before it was taken down, their whole purpose statement. It, BLM is Marxist. <laughs> it is. There, there's no doubt about that. There's no way of getting around that. Totally is. In fact, there's connections between um, BLM and, the, and, and, and in indirect ways, the Chinese Communist Party. Trevor Loudon put out a whole thing on this. So um, to mock those people, to, to, to think they're hypocrites and this kind of thing, but then to be like, well, yeah, I also like the people at Grove City College because they treat you like an individual. There's a lot of confusion here. And it gets worse. It just The confusion just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And, and it creates, I think when you hear this kind of thing, it creates, cause you're, you're, you're kind of like, I, th I think most people when they hear this who are ignorant of critical race theory or even maybe our own history, but they know that there's some bad stuff in it and well, they want to do the right thing. You, you hear something like this and you think, oh man, I don't want to be on the bad side of this. I, I want to be on the right side of history. And I, I want to, to be the person who is promoting change and equality. And I want to distance myself from the sins of my ancestors. And what can I do? And, uh, and, and you get little encouraging things, you know, little like, well, I, little statements that make you think like, well, it is possible for me to transcend these things, to rise above these things and to, to not, uh, to check my privilege, to make up for my white privilege, to help other uh, minorities by redistributing my privilege or using it for, for good instead of for evil. And you, like, you get that impression, right? So there's this sort of hope, this slight twinkle of hope baked into it. But then all, at the same time, there's this tension because you're, if you're white, like, well, you're just part of this category. You're just, you, you, this is the way you think, or this is the way, this is the privilege that you get allocated to you. And it's just, it's not fair. It's not right. Your very existence is just evidence of a disparity. And, 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 and so it's like back and forth. It's like guilt and hope, guilt and hope. And, and there's like, you, you never can get out of that. That's, that's one of the issues I've seen. I've seen this with people who get wrapped up in CRT. You, you like, you never get out of it. You're always on that hamster wheel, always trying to prove that you have checked your privilege appropriately or don't have it anymore, or you're, you're redeemed, you you've made up for it somehow. And, and yet like there's, you're, you're there's always so far to go. You're never quite there. And, and you see the way Chris is presenting this. It's, it's like, how does he characterize the people at Grove city college? It's like back and forth, back and forth. And so, um, so we're, we're going to see that, uh, I think even some more as we uh, go on, uh, he talks about, let's go to, he talks about white privilege some more. I want to hear some of that uh, if we, I think that'll be helpful. Our little bubble that were racist in homeschool. And so, and he was like, he's like, Mary, you might have a problem with that. I say, dog, as long as they don't bring it to my door, we good, fam. Like, um, because at the same time, like, I, I, I've learned how to navigate within majority culture, right? And so, like, I was used to the people sliding in, in, in these microaggressions and those foolish words, right? But at the same time, I was like, yo, like it, it's my job to speak up and say something. I mean, you have it again here, what I was just saying. It's like, hey, Grove City College is great because the people treat each other like individuals and they, they're inclusive. And then a few minutes later, well, the only reason I, I can be here is because well, I can navigate these microaggressions. I've learned how to exist within majority culture. I've, I've, like, there's this hegemony of uh, oppression that's existing there. But he just knows how to avoid the landmines. And yeah, the there's the the homeschool weird stuff, but as racist stuff, they, as long as they don't bring it to my door, you know, I I know how to navigate this. So there, there's this tension. I was like, and and that's, uh, it's like, which one is it? What, what what is life at Grove City College? Is it that, or is it what he said previously? We'll be like, no, nah, bro, we ain't gonna do this. Like, we, we will not do this because this does not represent the Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we can have have a conversation, but at the end of the day, dog, bro, we not gonna be 
out here acting like we, we don't know the Lord. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So. So has Grove City, and if so, how? Um, had, yeah, how, how, if, if a school has, how um, has white privilege been illustrated here? Because it, it, we need to be better. Um, I think from a staff's perspective, like, it's, it can be, it's so exhausting, like, not, like, seeing students, like, push back so much when you're trying to get them to see their friend's point of view. Like, why am I fighting with you on why you call your friend a monkey? an issue for you. So I think for me, and it's just like, and and, and, I, and, I, and, and, and and I know the minorities in this room, whether you, whether you're, you're a, 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 a woman, or specifically you are black, like, they can tell you, like, they have to go out of their way to make other people comfortable. They gotta, specifically the, the black students and the, and the Asian students, like they gotta tone down who they are to keep from offending their white counterparts all the time, you know? And, and, and they're almost like an afterthought sometimes where it's like, oh, oh, I forgot about you, dog. What you mean you forgot about me? Like you're supposed to be my, you're supposed to be my whole best friend. Like, how you forget about me? And not, and, and, and it's funny, right? Like we, we love to throw around these words like, oh, I don't see color. Yeah, you do. Don't act like you don't, and it's offensive to the Lord to act like you don't see color because he created me this way. And so one thing, like, and again, right, like th this isn't to, to spiritually manipulate people and emotionally abuse them, but it's like, it's offensive, offensive to the Lord to act like I don't exist, right? Like there are times where like, or my color doesn't exist, right? And so it's just like, we are not the same. I do not think the same way as you, and that's okay, you know? Uh, but I know the black students like here specifically are like, Chris, dog. It's tough, you know. And I had a little bit more diversity, right, at, 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 at Grace. And, like, we actually got, like, a, a black uh, student uh, student association or whatever. Uh, and so we had, like, an outlet. But the black students here don't have that. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it's a rarity that I see all black students eat together in the, in the cafeteria. Like, that wasn't my, my experience at, at, at Grace, right? Like, were, we we linked up, and it was, it was lit. You know what I'm saying? But then I have my white friends always saying, Y'all always sit at the cap like your white house at the table together. Oh my god, nobody said that you and all your wife only sit at the table together. Like, you know what I'm saying? And, and this is the same type of person, like, oh, I don't see color. Yeah. Like, so why are y'all like excluding yourself? I'm like, bro, we are not like, but most people, when you see people who look like you, you gravitate towards them. If you if you're gonna stick out like a sword though. Which at Grove City. You gotta stick out, dog. Like you, you, you look a little different. You know what I'm saying? And so if you're gonna go find people because there, there's like this, like this, 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 this letdown that you're like, oh, I can let my guard down when I'm around. Like I ain't gotta be super politically correct when I'm talking because you, we get each other. You know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm sure it's like the same way with women, right? Like you talk to your girls differently than you talk to your girlfriends sometimes. Like, and as you. Should, well, I, I, do, I don't you know, know that I do, but I think that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about girl, man. I was like, hey, girl, like, that dress don't look good on me. You know what I'm saying? But my mom, like, I'm like, Nate, dog, don't you, you can't go out like that. Like, I wouldn't tell, I would, I would tell any of my, like, you know what I'm saying, my lady friends, stuff like that. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, you know, uh, or even some of the black students, like, I know some of the black students here, like, see me in a very different light than some of my white students. Because I'm like, dog, I get like we, we, we get it, you know? And so uh, I know it's like super exhausting to be a minority in this space because like, and even then, right? It's like, oh, like, why do I always get, like, why is it that I have to be the one to educate you on your privilege? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, why do I have to talk to you that y'all like, you got an upper hand. And, that, and that's privilege in itself. The fact that you don't even realize that you have, this ability to win and you don't even have to try. Like, 
and, and, and honestly, right? Like, and, and, and maybe maybe it is me like having a chip on my shoulder or, you know, but it's like being one of, probably, I'm probably the only black RD that's ever served at this school, right? Uh, in the in hundred and odd years that it's been in existence. Like, I can't mess up. Like, I can't drop the ball because that can potentially mess it up for people that look like me to come behind. And, it's, and, 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 and I think, or at least I hope that, that people wouldn't le legitimately say that out loud, but you know they think, like, he's like, remember we had, we had that last one, he ain't turned out too good. You know what I'm saying? Just... All right, I'm gonna stop there. Notice a few things from what you just heard. You don't have to try. Uh, that's what white privilege is. You can win without trying. And yet you heard before, he said, I'm not saying, you know, your grandparents had white privilege. I'm not saying they didn't work hard. I'm not saying that you don't work hard. And then he literally comes back around and says, well, white privilege means you don't have to try, but you win. Which is it? Um, you keep hearing, obviously, going back and forth with the Wade Grove City Colleges. Apparently now it's it's exhausting. It's if you're a minority on, on campus, uh, it, it, he paints it as it's such a terrible thing. And one of the evidences he uses is, why do I have to come to you and tell you about your, why do I have to educate you on your white privilege? As if that that's an evidence of this. Well, that's the whole point of the podcast. <laughs> he's willing, He's willingly doing this. He's sitting down and he's educating everyone on their white privilege. And that's like half of what he talks about in this podcast. And yet he complains about it and says he, like he uses that as that's even a sign of white privilege. The fact that he has to explain the white privilege, he, like he shouldn't have to do that. Uh, so it's, <laughs> it, he says that, um, that minorities have to change who they are around white people. They're, they're constantly doing this. They have to change who they are. But then he also says, but we shouldn't have color blindness. You have to view everyone differently because he says even they don't think the same because I don't think the same because I'm black. Well, th this is we're dancing on the standpoint of epistemology stuff right now because it's like, you know, the, the your the, the what determines the, the determining factor in how you behave and what you think is going to be just your race. That's that's the thing that determines that. And and so he's saying, well, we're, we're different. We think differently. We're different. And but that's the, the thing is. If, if we're so different, if you can't have colorblindness, if you if you need to look at people and calculate how to treat them based upon who they are, racially speaking, and now he also brings up gender, then how do you not, how do you avoid not, uh, you have to, to treat people differently. You have to treat some people differently than other people. And, and, and his complaint is that it's, minorities can't be who they are because they don't want to offend white people but he's flipping it almost to, to be well white people now i guess they, they have to check their privilege be aware of this privilege uh don't ask me about i shouldn't be educating you you have a privilege and then they don't be colorblind you need to adjust the way that you treat people because we're different don't think that i think like you we're different uh you, you, your white friends might think the same but not me and so you're creating a situation in which people have to walk on eggshells in a way. They have to adjust the way that they uh, interact. And, 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 and so the very things he's complaining about, his solutions perpetuate. You see that throughout this whole thing. It's so contradictory. Even within minutes, he'll contradict himself on something. And, and it's, it's just interesting. The interviewer is not picking up on this. Um, this is apparently, according to President McNulty, they're... They don't have a problem with this at the school. I mean, does this sound to you from what I played so far? Does this sound like they're just engaging critical race theory in a negative way? Like, well, that's a bad thing. And we're going to show you what Christianity teaches and why the critical race theory is wrong. Or is this advocating for critical race theory on campus from someone who is an employee on campus? What, what do you think? Which one? Uh, let's get we only have a few more sections here. I wanted to. Um, talk about let's skip ahead to let's see well, we're almost there he talks i'm going to skip through this there's a section where he talks about systemic racism i'm going to just skip through that it's it's what you would expect he talks about uh well let's let, actually let's let's talk about that because he talks about diversity scholarships right near that here or at any of your other undergraduate um schools she asked if he's experienced systemic oh. racism I don't, I don't know if I can say call this racism. I don't know if it's ignorance. 
Because I think racism is a very strong word. And I, like, for me, when I call a person a racist, like, I'm not saying you can't come back from that, but dog, like for me, I'm just like, if I call you a racist, I'm like, yo, I don't trust you. You need, like the Lord need to deliver you. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not gonna argue with a racist individual. Ignorant people, we can do that. Cause I'm ignorant, I'm ignorant with the, like, the men, like, like I'm, I'm very ignorant, so I know. Oh, uh, but a racist individual, like, cause to me, it's like, you inherently think that something's wrong with my, like, with me as a person. Like, like my skin color offends you and you don't think that I'm worthy. Um, uh, but I would say, like, in undergrad, like, there was, like, this, there was this, there was this diversity scholarship. Listen to his example of racism, of, of systemic racism against him. He, he gives a few, but I'm just going to play this one. Listen to his first example that he gives here. He hits a scholarship. And, again, my homies, right, and, and, and we've had conversations, and I've grown, they've grown, and, and that's a beauty in that. But like they was tripping that I was getting a diversity scholarship. And I was just like, bro, why are you why are you so pressed about that? And he was like, well, they don't give us white people anything. I was like, you want the two thousand dollars that they're giving me a semester? You can have it. You know what I'm saying? Like I like my school is essentially paid for anyway. You know, so the two two grand I was essentially pocket. <laughs> like you know what I'm saying? But like, well, I was because I, at one point in time I was smart. Oh uh, no, I'm not I'm not stupid. I'm going to stop it right there. Listen to the story he gives, his first story. Just tell me whether or not this unravels the whole thing. He was given $2,000 a semester. That's $4,000 a year on a diversity scholarship at Grace College, a Christian college he went to. And he already had his school paid for, he said. And he, he was like, well, I'll just give it to my, you know, my white friend is like, wow, that's awesome. You got a, a diversity scholarship. Wow, we, we don't get that kind of thing. And he was kind of taking it for granted, like, you know, why are you impressed? Why are you impressed about this? Well, we don't get that. Um, and then he's like, well, I'll, I'll just give it to you because I don't actually need it. So he pocketed it. He took the $2,000. He just pocketed it. In other words, he, he had two, two grand extra a, a semester. And the question is, how have you experienced systemic racism? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't even know what to say. That His own answer refutes it's it's a self-refutation. I remember I had an experience like this myself in community college. I had a friend and we came from similar socioeconomic backgrounds and I didn't get anything for, I, I had a merit-based scholarship for uh, one year, I believe, that I applied for and got. And the rest of uh, college I paid for myself. I had to work and um, I also had to pay for transportation. And uh, my parents, while I was in college, this was their grace to me, they allowed me to stay at home rent-free. Uh, and uh, then, But if I wasn't in college, I couldn't. I had to pay rent. So, um, so there was an incentive in some ways to, to try to figure out a way to stay in college and pay for college. And, and this was early on. And I remember I was with a friend of mine who was, um, who was black, and we came from similar socioeconomic backgrounds. And he said, and we were friends, and he said to me, he, he, he oh, actually, we went to the cafeteria one day. I remember this. And he was getting some like expensive stuff. I couldn't afford it. It just, I, I wasn't able to go to the cafeteria and buy stuff a, a lot of the time. I would pack a lunch or um, if I did get something at the cafeteria, it was usually something cheap. I mean, he got this this great meal. And I just, I, I asked him one day, like how he was able to afford that because I knew he wasn't working and I, and I was and I, I couldn't afford it. And he said to me, well, I, I have a stipend for food. And, and I, I was curious, and, and um, maybe, the, you know, at the time, maybe this showed my ignorance, but I, I just said, well, how, how do you get that? You know, I thought maybe maybe I can get in on this. And, and I said, is it because, did, did you get it because of like a, how much money your dad makes or did, when you filled out your FAFSA or something? Like, did were you able to submit that and you, you fell within a bracket? And he goes, no, it's not that. It's, it's because I'm black. And he just said it straight to me. He says, because I'm black, I, I was able to get this. And he goes, I also get a gas uh, I get money for gas so I can pay for that. And if I have anything extra, he goes, I just keep it and spend it. And I remember the moment this happened <laughs> because I was like, it, 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 in my mind, I was like, does not compute. How in the world? Like, I, I was like, this doesn't seem fair to me. How come, it, how, how come, like, I don't have any of this available to me and you do. And, and, and it didn't breed any resentment, uh, thank God in me. 
Uh, I know for some people that can breed resentment. Uh, that's where, where you, you create racists. <laughs> the, and I shouldn't, I don't even like using the word racist. Let's just use a biblical word. You create people who are uh, parsh, show partiality based, based on es- ethnicity simply because uh, of experiences like that. And they, they're like, why is my money, why is my taxpayer money or this institution's money or the, what I'm paying in tuition, why is it going for this, you know? And, and so some people, they, they get they can get resentful. I don't know a lot of people like that, but I know some people can be like that. And I wasn't resentful, but I was, uh, it did bother me at the time just a little bit because I, I, I just, um, and this, this particular person ended up, they didn't finish their degree. They didn't take it seriously. Uh, they, they tended to just skip class regularly. And, um, and, and I was thinking, man, they, they have a subsidized degree. Not everyone does that who's subsidized, but they have this, this great privilege. Let's use the word. It's a privilege to be able to have your school paid for and your money, your gas and your food. You, that, that, man, that's not something that all of us have. And then to kind of squander it. And it just, the waste bothered me. I've always been bothered by waste. In my own life, I'm bothered when I waste when I waste things. And so um, th- this individual, Chris Merrick, who works at Grove City, he had, it sounds like a similar situation. He just gave, he two, pocketed 4,000 bucks uh, a year that was unnecessary money he just got because he was black. And, and that's supposed to be evidence somehow of white privilege. That sounds like privilege to me. It sounds like, you know, you got some privilege here. Uh, so, um, I, I just, I don't even know what to say other than what I have said. It's just, it, it, it really sticks a needle in the eye of that narrative when, uh, when you have something like that. So, um, let's see, let's keep going. Let's see. He says, um, let's just keep playing this. I'm going to keep playing this from where we are. College was just like, it was a breeze for me. Uh, and so, um. But yeah, like he was like, he was upset that he felt like black people got special treatment. And then he was, he was coming at me. And I'm just like, you mad at me that they give me money? What's you want me to turn it down? Would you turn it down? Absolutely not. You know what I'm saying? And I told him that. I was like, would you turn down two grand a semester? Uh, so what? <laughs> Talk to the president, dog. Like I'm not gonna do. Like I'm not gonna turn down two grand because it's gonna make my friend feel better by himself. Oh. Like, okay, let's turn the argument around on him. This is this is the jujitsu move right here. Okay, the, this is the Achilles heel of this whole podcast right here. He is upset that his friend was upset. His friend's saying, "Well, how, basically, how is this fair?" And he wants, according to Chris Merrick, he wants to hold Chris responsible. Like, why would you do that? Why would you take two thousand dollars when you didn't? You don't need it. You didn't earn it, and now it's just free. And it, you know, probably with the, the edge of my tuition money is going to help subsidize yours. Why would you take that? And Chris is defensive and says, "Well, you 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 have a problem with that? You go talk to the president about it. I didn't set it up. What's the whole issue with white privilege? What's the whole thing? The whole argument that they give is that." There was this system that was set up and it's not white people individually who set it up, but it was set up and they're benefiting from it. Therefore, what do you need to do? You need to check your privilege. You need to redistribute somehow. Uh, You need to do something to remedy this disparity that exists. And in this situation, you have black people getting a special privilege that they didn't set up themselves, but they're willingly taking, they're taking it. It's an, and this is, and this isn't a fake thing. This isn't like white privilege. Oh, it's out there. Just trust me. This is like, actually, you can put a number on it. You have $4,000 right here, um, in objective reality. And what's the response? How dare you question me? How dare you uh, are upset at me for this? You go and, and you, you, you complain about the system. If you want to complain about the system, I'm just going to pocket this money that you help subsidize. It is a direct contradiction, direct this is someone who is a hypocrite, who doesn't practice what they preach. Uh, because when he's in a situation where he's getting benefit allocated to him on the basis of his race, then he is defensive of receiving that. And he doesn't see the problem with it. And he thinks that the people complaining shouldn't keep hold him responsible. And yet he holds white people responsible uh, for 
the white privilege that they have on the basis of the fact that he wants them to do something about it. They got to check their privilege somehow. And we're going to hear some clips from that here soon. They wouldn't be talking about this if that wasn't the case. So it's just it's so inherently contradictory. This whole thing is a bundle of contradictions. Uh, let's go to uh, let's skip ahead just a little bit um, to a question that gets brought up here from the interviewer. I think is a student. Was this bias like, oh, like here's this black kid, and we were few far in between and went to Warsaw, Indiana, right? And so like, and, and I'm sure like he had these preconceived notions, like we all do, right? Kids just like happen to come out and do what followed me. I was like, bro, like you don't, like I'm not gonna steal from Walker and his dog. I'm sorry, like I just, I'm just not, right? And my dad, like my dad would kill me, like, and I like living, so um, I, I didn't do it. So I was trying to educate myself about privilege before and while writing this episode, and I came across a very sad reality, especially given the fact that we all attend a Christian school. And that is that people of faith historically, and unfortunately in some cases today, we've talked about this a little bit, um, have worked against racial justice. And specifically, I looked into Jamar Tisby's book, who I think he was here last year or the semester before, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, the Color of Compromise, and how he details and describes the fact that um, some white Christian leaders not only vindicated and excused, but promoted racial bigotry and discrimination. I want to stop here and just make this one point. The whole argument is that, well, we just had these people in chapel from the administration. We just we had Jamar Tisby come. Okay, we had, we had him come, and then Carl Truman comes out and says, well, you know, maybe that wasn't the best idea. But we're, we're unapologetically Christian and we're not pro CRT and all this. You have an evidence right here in real time. Here's a student who, guess what? Guess who influenced her to start looking into privilege? Guess who helped show, lead her down this garden path towards CRT? It was Jamar Tisby coming to chapel. Do you realize how, what an effect a chapel message can have and then a series of them for two weeks? Do you, do you, I mean, even if it was just that alone, which it's not, that's bad enough. And it's having a real effect. And the evidence is right here in this podcast. So I just wanted to point that out. Uh, now, um, we get to uh, another section here. We're almost done. Uh, I only have, I think, two or three more sections I want to show you. Believers would probably call Jesus a socialist. And for me, it's like, how then? Have you crazy? Like, what are you not seeing? And again, I'm, and I'm not at a place where I'm like, oh, we need to just make everything free, right? But it, it, it pisses me off so much because it's like, dog, like we serve Jesus. Like we should not be the ones who are, we should be the ones mistreating people. And, 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 and I think we, we have gone to this place where you ask a Christian what their views are on certain topics, like it comes across as bigotry. So I get that. Like I, I truly do. But like, like, we shouldn't be in places where we are mistreating people or we are, we're being okay with people being mistreated, right? And, and, I, and I'm not talking about like white people trying I'm going to stop here. I really want to play the rest, but I, I, I've got to keep moving along here. But if you caught at the beginning there, he says, if Jesus were to come back today, then the um, Christians today, would, would they would consider him to be a socialist. The, the concern, and these are the people at Grove City College. They would, they would think he's a socialist. Uh, that's that's who the authentic Jesus is. Uh, is and he didn't say he is a socialist. He's saying that he would be considered that by uh, by by. So, so Jesus is basically on the social justice bandwagon to some extent. That's what he's saying. Jesus, and, and on the basis of the fact that well, Jesus would treat people equally. And what does equality mean? Well, it's BLM. And how do you know that, John? Well, let's skip ahead uh, a little bit and let's see what he says here. Lord Jesus is like, I'm gonna love you regardless of the stupidity that you do. And that if I say that I love Jesus and I'm following his statutes, like I have to love people regardless if they love me back or not. And there's a greater reward too. Like and Jesus talks about this, like what what do you get out of loving people who are similar to you? That's easy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like and so and I think it, it shows a testament to who the Lord is when we're able to forgive and step and, and encounter people who are different. So going off of that, let's talk about this idea of equality, because the first time I met you, it was something that we talked about mm -hmm. um, quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And from what I can tell and have read, that is the sole motivator behind the Black Lives Matter movement. So straight up, 
what does equality mean? Um, I think like there's this component that like we're all like treated fairly. Um, and we're all treated with some respect. Um, yeah, like, I'm not gonna say treat, yeah, treat guys how you wanna be treated and like, so, so Black Lives Matter, that's what she brings up. It's equality. What is that? What's that? Well, it just means treating people how you want to be treated. Does that mean getting extra scholarships because of your race? What does that mean? Does that, is it, he, he doesn't delve into the actual, he, he keeps it on this broad level of Christian principles and we're just all supposed to assume, yeah, BLM's part of that. That's just, that's what they're about. They're just about treating people equally. And if Jesus were to come back, people today would think he's a socialist because he'd be for that too. But what's BLM's conception of equality, right? Uh, it's not an equality before the law. It's an equality that adjusts for different social locations and redistributes based upon that. All right, let's go to um, just uh, the, the practical stuff here at the end. This is the last uh, part of it that I wanted to um, talk about. So he's asked a question uh, about how basically he could leverage, how, how people should leverage privilege. All treated with some respect. Uh, yeah, like, I'm not gonna say treat, yeah, treat guys how you wanna be treated and like give people the, plat the platform to, to have the same benefits that you have, you know? Um, so how can I, we, as privileged people, employ our privilege as a catalyst for that equality? I think you leverage it, right? Like you, like how many are, there's a game you white in this room, you're with a white person. White people, how many of y'all have a uh, say in that being created white? Anybody? I gotta skip ahead for time's sake. I'll try to, I'll put the info, um, the, the link in the info section. Basically what he says though, I'll just summarize for you. You gotta leverage your privilege and where do you go to do that? You look at Google. He literally says that. Go to Google and Google ways that you can leverage your privilege. Uh, and and so it, 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 he leaves it kind of open-ended, um, but it's it, it, like, this is the language of CRT. This is what we're hearing. That you gotta leverage your privilege. You gotta do something extra because of the, uh, allocation of benefits that you're receiving as a result of your race or your skin color, you must then uh, do something about that because that's not a right state of affairs, except I guess if you get $2,000 a semester for your race, that somehow is okay. All right. Um, now, he, he says something interesting at the end too, and I wanted to share it with you too because he goes back and forth on Grove City College and well, you know, is it, what is it? I mean, it's, is people are loving each other there and it's a good environment for him or it's a bad environment. And he goes back and forth, back and forth. Check this out. Hey, Chris, where do you go to church around here and why? I don't go to church in Grove City because there's not no diversity. Uh, and if I was going to stay here in Grove City long term, I needed to be around people who looked like me or who had, like, I needed to be comfortable. Like I needed one place in this town where I was gonna be comfortable. So I go to church in Pittsburgh. We're actually not open. It's ACDAC down there, but we're, we're not open because COVID and it's too many people. But All right, we're gonna stop it right there. Um, <laughs> the last question, the, the where they end this whole thing. Chris, where do you go to church? Uh, this whole thing about, well, we gotta, it, it, uh, gotta judge people individually. Um, you gotta check your privilege, but you gotta, you know, look at people individually and, um, we, we can, Grove City College is a great place because people treat each other as individuals and we just gotta love people. Hey, where do you go to church? I, I can't stand the whiteness here. I just can't stand the, there's no diversity. I, I'm not comfortable being at Grove City and I can't even stay here long term at Grove City because it's of all the white people. So I go to a church that I have to travel to go to because I don't want to be around all these white people. That's, that's, this is CRT guys. I don't know, like, how else to sugarcoat it. That's exactly what you're hearing. This is someone who, and, and, and I feel bad for him. It's not, I don't want to condemn this guy. I feel sorry for him. There's, walking around life with um, this, I mean, he even said at one point in this, he goes, I don't know if I have a chip on my shoulder. Yeah, I mean, you, you kind of do. You kind of do. 
uh, and and if you you feel the need that you have to go to church somewhere else because you just those white people are just exhausting you and it's I, I need the diversity and here's the thing like if you here, here's the thing if you want to go worship with a group of people that's culturally uh, similar to you there's nothing wrong with that they're gonna do songs differently and maybe the sermon style is different and there, there's nothing wrong with that but you don't it's not because well I'm just just exhausted by all these white people. You can't, it's just not an option for me to go to church in Grove City because too many white people. And it's, no, it's just, make it about what you love, not what you're, what you, what, what you can't stand, what, what irritates you. What, and, and if a white person were to say this, what would you say? Well, I can't go to church in downtown uh, Chicago or I don't know where, you know, I can't go to church in this inner city area because I need my white people. I have to, you know, that would be just called racist out of hand. That would be, that would be horrible. You can't have that. Right. But this is totally acceptable. So you see so many contradictions in this all over the place. Uh, and, and I just want to point this out to you. I mean, just to go over a few of them again for review here, uh, you have, you can be treated like trash at Grove city college. And, and you can say that and then make all these comments about how white Grove City College is. And if you're a minority, you're treated like trash. That's perfectly OK to say. Um, but yet you can't. Uh, it's evidence. It's white privilege. If someone says something, uh, a racial, uh, an acronym that includes a racial slur, even if it's universally condemned by everyone, if one person says it and they're condemned for it, that's white privilege. But it's not black privilege or any minority privilege to be able to to imply that white people treat you like trash. Uh, you have the, the, this whole thing about you shouldn't box people in. Don't put anyone in a box, he says, about the 43-minute mark. But then most of this is putting people in a box. It's They're in this white privilege box. That's who they are. And I, I can't even go to church around here because so, of the box that exists here on campus of all these white people. I shouldn't even have to educate you on your systemic racism or your, your, your white privilege, rather. Uh, but then I'll do a whole podcast doing just that, educating you on your white privilege. Um, systemic racism is, is everywhere present, but yet, and you got to check your privilege if you're white, but yet if you are black and on the basis of that get a big scholarship, then you have no obligation to redistribute any of that money. You just pocket it and that's perfectly fine and no one should complain to you about it. Uh, Jesus um, apparently would have been called a socialist. And uh, it's, it's unfair that people think BLM is Marxist. And yet, uh, he, there's a point in this I didn't play, but he's like, we got to transcend politics. We just can't be political. But yet, he gets political. Um, you have, uh, <laughs> and, and then, of course, the, the ending of this whole thing, uh, which, which just takes the cake for me. It just, I, I'm like, why would you work at this institution then? And why would the administration think that's not a threat to the institution to characterize the institution like this? But yet someone who points out that someone's saying this about the institution, there's a threat. Uh, well, the only way I think you get there is you got to be motivated by CRT somehow or some some uh, something related to CRT. So that that's the podcast. I just wanted I was asked uh, to review this. I did review it. Hopefully that was helpful for you all. And. Um, and if anything, there's that I want to. If there's anything I want to emphasize with all this is, you know, when you hear folks trying to educate others on critical race theory, watch out for these kinds of contradictions that you're going to hear, and maybe ask ask really good questions about that. Like, what about affirmative action? What about um, what about special diversity based scholarships? Is that right or wrong? Or and on what basis is it right or wrong? Uh, and and why is is that okay? Uh, and this other thing isn't okay? And what, why, what, what's the moral principle foundationally at the bottom of all of this? Uh, or, or is it just this blank check equality that isn't really doesn't have much of a definition to it, but when issues arise, we, we better be out on the street for whatever it is. Uh, that, that's, I mean, checking your privilege and saying go to Google, which is what he says, go to Google, find out. Well, I mean, that's going to just uh, corral you into the arms of true Marxists. I mean, that's what the whole Marxist engine runs on. You know, why not then, you know, let's just deplatform or defund the police. If you Google it, I mean, that's, you're going to find all kinds of ungodly ways to check your privilege. Uh, how about instead we we look to the Bible? And that's one thing you don't find in this podcast. You're not finding any biblical anything. It's just subjective. This is what Chris Merrick thinks of the world. And this is someone, I'll remind you all, who is employed 
at Grove City College as the assistant director of the residence life and resident director of Kettler Hall, someone who, who's drawing a paycheck from Grove City College. So all these, this is the stage we're in at Grove City College. You can't even question Grove City College uh, without pushback that, well, there's no CRT here, or it's not, it's minimal, or it's not affecting anything. It totally is, totally is. And this is just evidence of it. All right, God bless. Hopefully that was helpful for those who are uh, paying attention to this issue and involved in this issue. Keep fighting. Keep fighting there at Grove City. Uh, this this is not going to this is not over by any stretch of the imagination, um, and I and I really do pray and hope that things work out well there. That th- there is a course correction, and I for people like Christopher Merrick even I pray for him uh, today that just that he he would see all these contradictions that he's engaging in, and just see how how detrimental this is not just to him but the, to the people that he's advocating this poison to. It is poison. Uh, how about we actually look at people, and, and we can certainly take into effect their culture, uh, their race, uh, being attached to that in some way as well, but we don't, we, we don't then have to walk on eggshells figuring out how do we treat this person differently because of, uh, the, the, of their race or their social location, or we have to, when do we sit and shut up and listen, and then when do we uh, get, try to check our privilege, and what do we do about that, and we're not even quite sure, and like, we're Christians, all right? We're Christians. It's a Christian college. We're Christians. Uh, we, we have certain fundamental values that we agreed to, or we at least knew were baked into it when we came to the college and, and we just treat people with respect no matter who they are. And that doesn't mean doing some extra BLM thing because, uh, that, that, that's the thing. That's the thing. So it's just much easier, it's much simpler. And there's, there's less opportunities for offense and walking on eggshells and paranoia and all the rest of it. If, uh, we would just treat people. And I think he said it. He quoted it even. You treat people the way that they, that you want to be treated. Um, treat people with kindness. Uh, it and 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 not a Marxist infused. There, what what they think of kindness is, you know, you gotta change everything you're doing for this group of people and give give them some of your money, give them some of your uh, privilege somehow. Uh, no, just uh, just treat them like you would. I, I, look, here, here's for me. I, I do have many black friends. I know some some people on the social justice side might be surprised about that. I don't know. But um, I, I have Hispanic friends. I have family members who are Hispanic and Jewish. And um, I go to an extremely diverse church, uh, racially speaking. And we don't have these kinds of problems there. So we all just treat each other the way we want to be treated. We all just love each other. We all just know that the, the actually the biggest thing that we share in common is the fact that we're in Christ and that we don't deserve his love and we get it and we're adopted into his family. It just, it makes things a lot simpler. And I think couldn't Grove City College have that? This, this is, this kind of a speech just divides people. It just creates resentment. It just creates a, whether it's, it's white people resenting their parents and grandparents or whether it's uh, you know, people resenting the fact that wh- why is it that you got to do all these adjustments and give special privileges now to minorities because you know, they were in, in a certain, you know, view them as a, a, a just a, a collection, a, a box in a, in a way and adjust everything you're doing uh, to, to to take from yourself and give to them. Um, you know, that creates resentment, too. And and it's it's just better to view people as they're they're different people who come from Appalachia who might just be as white as I am uh, often lived with. A, a much different, they had a much different way of life and much, much more impoverished than I was. Uh, and, but, but I look, when I was growing up, we, we had our money issues when I was a kid and someone who, who is black and living in a rich family didn't have those kinds of issues like I did. So it's, we're different. We're different people. Okay. And, and that it's a much easier and much better way to treat people rather than trying to then, Oh, someone's coming towards me. Let's calculate who they are based on their melanin tone and then uh, how are we going to treat this person and oh man like I'm so worried that I'm I might offend them if I uh, if I if I let them know who I truly am it's just here's who I am here's who I am all right uh, I've gone too long <laughs> god bless hope this is helpful for you by now